I have a bio on uh, Dr. Hardy to read for you. Uh, incidentally, um, uh, meeting Dr. Hardy today was quite a, a treat for me. Uh, he's had a great impact on my life. Uh, I was telling him that I was telling my students that uh, I said, think of meeting someone uh, in very just big and important in your world, like Captain America. That's what it's like to, to meet Grant Hardy. Uh, Dr. Hardy is a professor of history and religious studies at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. He has authored Worlds of Bronze and Bamboo, Sima Chen, Conquest of History, Chen's Conquest of History, The Establishment of the Han Empire and Im Imperial China, and Understanding the Book of Mormon, A Reader's Guide. Uh, I haven't read the first, uh, but I have read Understanding the Book of Mormon, and it is a for any serious student of the Book of Mormon, it is a must read. Understanding the Book of Mormon, a reader's guide. He has produced two lecture series for the great courses on Asian thought and world scripture and edited the Book of Mormon, a reader's edition, the Oxford History of Historical Writing, volume one, and most recently, the Maxwell Institute Study Edition, Book of Mormon. Dr. Hardy. Thank you. Thank you for coming out early on a Saturday morning. It looks like we've got a lot of people from the community, which is great. We've got a few students. I, I teach college. I know what students' uh, typical um, uh, schedules are like, and so it means a lot to me that we've got some students on Saturday morning. As I begin <clears throat> here, I want to do something a little bit different. Um, as you are well aware of, um, the symposium this year, Sperry Symposium, is about Alma's sermons to his sons in Alma's chapter 36 to 42. In this talk, I'm, I wanna back up a little bit for a wider perspective and talk about what those sermons look like in the context of Alma's writings as a whole, or at least the, the book of Alma. The second thing that's gonna be a little different is unlike my wife Heather last night who gave dozens of observations about Alma 36 and 37 woven together in sort of a nice aesthetic package. I'm going to give you one big idea and I'm going to tell it to you a dozen times to try to persuade you that this is, this is uh, the way we should read the Book of Mormon. And then third, um, my talk is, is, is published in the book. You can read it if you would like to. Um, I'm going to try not to read my talk. Um, so it's not my intention to give you the audio version of what you can buy out in the, the, the foyer there. Um, I don't feel like I have a lot of talent in speaking off the top of my head, so this will be much scarier for me and much more interesting for you as, as you can watch me try to scramble for, for wording. So um, here we go. Um, historians have a problem when they write history in that they can't write everything. There's no way that they can include everything that had happened or even mention everything that had happened. So historians have to make decisions about what they're gonna include, what they're gonna leave out, and how they're gonna organize what they, have, um, what they have put in their volumes. And that is certainly the case for Alma the Younger. Um, um, the Book of Alma seems pretty long. It can be sort of a struggle to get through. It's the, certainly the longest in the Book of Mormon. So I'm gonna just start by, oh yeah, this is another, um, this is my mega point, right? So in the Book of Mormon, form works with content to enrich and develop the message. Okay, and then I'm gonna give you this other point that you're gonna hear a lot of times. This one will only come back once. Okay, so this is Alma chapters one through 44. This is the part of Alma that was written by Alma. At chapter 45, there's a shift that happens in the writers and his son Helaman is gonna take over. I don't know why they didn't divide it and you know, have a book of first Helaman and second Helaman, but this is Alma's writings. And, if you, and I, I put it in a, a, a format here where you can see some of the major things that happen. I think this is a fairly accurate depiction of what's happening. And if you look, there might be, you might notice a kind of chiastic structure to it. Certainly in the, Beginning and the end, there's warfare that's happening. That's clear enough. And I think that there are probably some, uh, some parallels with numbers three and five there, the missionary journeys of the sons of Mosiah and Alma speaking to the Zoramites. In fact, it seems to me like Alma speaking to the Zoramites is trying to recreate some of the excitement and success that happened with the sons of Mosiah. So he invites the sons of Mosiah to come with him on this uh, he's going to gather the A-team together, right, to put together this, this missionary effort in Antionum, and he's hoping for similar success. Of course, 
if you're familiar with, with the literature on chiasmus, this is going to look a little bit odd to you, because right in the middle I'm going to have Korahor, you know, not Jesus, but actually an antichrist in the middle. But this is significant because the story of Korahor portrays one of the strongest challenges to faith, particularly an intellectual challenge to faith, and it's going to be faith in Jesus Christ. And it's important that that message comes through so clearly when Alma responds to that situation. But what I'm going to talk about this morning is these parallels. The preaching journeys of Alma in chapters 4 through 16, and then Alma's testimony to his sons, which is the focus of this Sperry Symposium. The first thing that you might notice is that there are three of each of them. Um, that is more significant than you might assume, because we know from the narrative that Alma taught in more than three cities. He mentions the fact that he taught in the city of Melek, and he also taught in the city of Sidon as well. And somehow those just got left out. Somebody made a decision, let's have three cities. Whether that's Alma himself and his record, or maybe Mormon in his editing, but somebody made a decision about what to leave off. And then you have these nice, uh, um, a nice correspondence with the sermons to the sons. The second thing that you might notice as you're looking at those is there are headings for each of these blocks of text. And those headings are part of the original dictation of the Book of Mormon. So they were in the gold plates. So again, whether it's Alma or whether it's Mormon as the editor, they're marking those off and saying these are special blocks of text. Pay attention to how these fit together. And then also as you thumb through, you might know, oh yeah, this is the pairs that are going to happen. You might notice that um, Zarahemla, the sermon there is kind of a medium length. Chapter 5 is a long chapter. Chapter 7 is a much shorter chapter. And then this uh, sermons to Ammonihah is long, right? Just relatively speaking. And then if you, when you get to the latter half of, of, of Alma's writings in the Book of Alma, um, Helaman has sort of a medium sermon. Shiblon's is much shorter. And then this is much longer. So that, that should just raise your eyebrows to say, hmm, what's going on? With, um, with this. And I think that there are similarities in the people that they're writing, or the, the people that Alma is addressing as well. These thematic uh, similarities that have to do with corresponding spiritual conditions of each pair of the audience. The first sermon is, is addressed to someone or some group who is wavering. Okay, that's clearly the case in Zarahemla. You may recall that the sermon there consists of about 50 rhetorical questions as Alma is inviting people to think about their spiritual state and to think about where they're going where they're, um, and, and where they might end up as well. There, Zarahemla has some good people. It has some people who are having struggles, and he wants to encourage everyone to choose the right. Um, Helaman... Um, that is a more difficult case, and I'm going to read in a little bit, but it seems to me that the relationship between Alma the Younger and his son Helaman is, it may have a little bit of tension in it. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, later on, well, we have already know that when Alma the Younger goes to Antionum, to speak, he takes two of his sons, he takes his younger sons, he doesn't take Helaman. We don't know why that happens, but he leaves him behind. Um, also, um, when uh, Shiblon, when he talks to, sorry, Corianton, and he says, oh, remember the example of your elder brother, like be like him, be like, be like Shiblon. He doesn't mention Helaman for some reason. And then last and probably most important for me is in Alma 37, he's going to talk about handing on the plates. He's going to talk about the, the sacred artifacts. That handoff is not going to happen until a, a year later. And when it happens in Alma 50, we learn out of the blue that Helaman was not Alma's first choice of who to give the records to. He actually intended to give them to the chief judge, Nephiha, and Nephiha turned him down and he said, oh, I guess I'm gonna have to give him to Helaman. Okay, Helaman turned, I love Helaman, he's like one of my heroes in the Book of Mormon, but there's something odd with his relationship with his father. So that's why I'm gonna put him in this kind of wavering group. Um, Gideon is a city that has seen some, uh, some fighting there before. They've suffered a lot of hardships and they are clearly steadfast. In the, in the faith, and Alma recognizes that. And similarly, Gideon is somebody who seems um, happy, to do, happy to do what's right, and uh, has been, and been successful in that. Um, 
to the people of Gideon, Alma says, because of your, your faith is strong, great is my joy. And it's matched by his, uh, his delight in Shiblon. He says, I have had great joy in thee already because of thy faithfulness and thy diligence. Okay, and then the last correspondence is not hard to see. Ammonihah is clearly a wicked city. They have already rejected um, Alma when he goes back to them. Um, and he starts out with a, a strong, a stern admonition to them, a warning. He calls them a wicked and perverse generation and warns them that if they don't repent, God will utterly destroy you from off the face of the earth. That turns out to be a fair evaluation of the spiritual condition of those people. You may remember that after they reject his message and then uh, they put Alma and Amulek in prison and eventually they're going to uh, murder the, the wives and children of the, the converts, the Zoramite converts. So it's pretty, pretty awful. Um, Corianton uh, is not that wicked, but he has had some problems and Alma mentions those pretty specifically. You may recall that, that Corianton had abandoned his missionary responsibilities in such a way that it, it kind of undermined his father's message. Um, uh, it seems to have something to do with sexual transgression. This is something that we uh, talk about in Latter-day Saint circles, uh, uh, being next to murder. I'm not sure that it's entirely sexual transgression. Um, I think it probably, that may be involved, the, the circumstances are not exactly clear, but it seems to me that Alma is particularly concerned about how his son has, has uh, abandoned the ministry, a calling that he'd been given um, for whatever reason that might have been, in a way that's detrimental to the mission as a whole. So he has a lot to talk about with Corianton, and Corianton has actually a lot of questions as well. Questions about the resurrection, about the plan of salvation, um, and some of those questions mirror questions that leaders in Ammonihah had had. Um, in fact, um, I'll come to that in more detail later on. But in both sermons, Alma is going to talk about the example of Adam and Eve. He's going to talk about spiritual and temporal death. He's going to talk about a probationary state. So these sermons have a lot in common. Okay, so basically thematic um, uh, parallels, structural parallels. Oh, but what really matters are verbal connections. Um, and the Book of Mormon is a highly repetitive text. You can find phrases that sort of go all over the place. So I'm gonna pay particular attention to phrases that have a prominent position or phrases that are distinct, that tend to be used only a few times in the Book of Mormon, particularly in these pairs of, of sermons. Skilled orators take time, um, take great care with their opening lines because people remember what people say at first, right? It's gonna set the tone, it's gonna catch the attention of your audience. And um, as I said, they tend to remember that. So look at this. Um, in Zarahemla, just in the first verses of chapter five, Alma reminds them of the captivity and deliverance of their fathers. He tells them to put their trust in God and he uses this phrase, born of God. And the same things happen in the opening verses to, to chapter 36. Remember the captivity of your fathers, put trust in God and, and, and be born of God. In Gideon, he starts out by saying, I trust that I shall have joy over you. To his son Shiblon, he says, I trust that I shall have great joy in you. Those are the only two occasions in the Book of Mormon where that expression shows up. In Ammonihah, in, toward the beginning, he uses this phrase, except you repent, you can in no ways inherit the kingdom of God. You might guess that he says pretty much the same thing to Corianton. That phrase shows up four times in the Book of Mormon, but two of those are here. It's fairly distinct. I've got a few more examples of not just the opening verses, but sort of all the way through. If you go looking for parallels, they are there to be seen. So um, in Zarahemla, Alma talks about being delivered from the chains of hell three times, encircled about by the bands of death, and you see the same phrases in, in chapters 36 and 37. Those are actually the only two places in the Book of Mormon where encircled about by the chains, chains or bands of death appear. In Gideon, um, he uses an allusion to Abinadi and then uses the phrase temperate in all things. Uh, quotation from Abinadi, again, temperate in all things. Those are the only two occasions of temperate in all things in the Book of Mormon, though it does come from the King James Bible, right? You can see it in 1 Corinthians. And then, oh, I'll come back to this one. In Ammonihah and Coriantin, those are just, 
those are just longer chapters, and there's a lot going on, and they're talking about similar sorts of things, and so here's the scariest slide. There are, there's, there's just a lot of parallels. What I want you to pay attention to is the brackets on the right-hand side, so you can see these numbers, right? The first number up at the top is a zero. That's the number of times this phrase occurs in the Old Testament. The next number is the number of times it occurs in the New Testament, and the third number is the number of times it occurs in the Book of Mormon. And as you look through those phrases, you can see lots of twos and lots of threes. Like these are phrases that are pretty distinctive for these, for these two blocks of sermons. Okay, you have to be careful. That our undergrad students will be very aware of this from their psychology classes. You have to be careful of confirmation bias, right? Because if I go looking for parallels, I can. I can probably find parallels because there's a lot of repetition. And, and if I look for parallels that don't fit this pattern that I'm telling you, they are there. There are some phrases where, that show up in uh, some, I'll do it this way, in some of the sun sermons that never show up in the city sermons, or some of the phrases that show up in a sun sermon with the wrong city sermon. I mean, you can find some things like that. But not as many as this other kind. Like, like if you try to track all of the phrases there are, where they appear in the Book of Mormon, you'll see a pattern come through that I think is, is, is fairly clear. Um, taken together, these parallel structures and thematic correspondences and verbal connections constitute a, a type of literary signposting. Alma is signaling to observant readers that he would like you to compare the preaching of Zarahemla with his sermon to, to Helaman, and likewise for Gideon and Shiblon and Ammonihah and Corianton. Okay, have I said this already like half a dozen times? It's gonna come more, like I'm gonna hammer it, tell you that I'm gonna, I'm trying to give you good reasons, though it may sound like I'm trying to, to uh, beat you into submission here and seeing this the way that I'm seeing it. The two sets of sermons were delivered, if I go back to it, will I get, okay, two sets of sermons are delivered 10 years apart. And when you look at comparisons, there's some questions that might come up. It seems reasonable to look for some development. Has, has Alma's ideas changed a little bit over the course of 10 years? Or how does he appeal to groups rather than individuals? Or is there something here that he's aware of his, uh, for the sons, he's aware of sort of he's coming to the end of his life, his ministry, he wants to pass on his, his legacy? If you're thinking of those kinds of questions, I'll, I'll take the first one. Is there some sort of development that might happen in these? And I think we can find some of this. Um, both in this first pair are about spiritual de deliverance. Um, and, uh, and Alma also mentions his, his, the, the source of his spiritual knowledge. But there is some development. Whereas in, in chapter 5, um, you get some uh, general ideas, some historical examples of deliverance, spiritual and temporal deliverance. When he's speaking to Helaman, he's talking about deliverance, but it's much more personal, right? He's, he's sharing an experience that he had, a, 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 a dramatic experience, spiritual experience. Um, he actually talks in chapter 5 about how do I know of these things? And he talks about prayer and fasting. He doesn't say, an angel came and told me these things which would seem like the obvious thing to say to a city. He doesn't say that. When he talks to his son, he does give a, something much more, um, much more personal and much more vivid and, and intense. The chiastic structure of Alma 36 tends to, to, to lend itself to that sort of intensity. In to Gideon and to Shiblon, humility is one of the main things he talks about. He says, see that you're not lifted up unto pride and see that you don't boast in your own wisdom. He says that to his son. To the city, he says, be gentle, sorry, be humble and be submissive and gentle. But the idea is a little bit more complicated when he's talking to his son because there are times when submissiveness might not be the right course of action. To his son, he continues and says, use boldness but not overbearance. Can you be bold and humble at the same time? And and this is a question that, that, that may come up. I don't exactly have an answer for that, but Alma seems to say, suggest that you can. He, he says, bridle all your passions that you may be filled with love. And perhaps that's a, a comment on what it means to be humble, to seeing other people as we might see ourselves or love ourselves. And, um, and he warns of, let's see. Okay, we're good enough for that. Let's go to the next one. Okay, to the people of Ammonihah, He's going to teach some doctrines, and, um, um, and he's going to teach similar doctrines to Corianton, 
but they're going to be expanded. So it's not just resurrection and the plan of salvation, but it's also going to be about restoration and God's justice. I wonder if in the, the intervening 10 years that Alma has been thinking more about what he said to the people at Ammonihah, been thinking more about how to, how to portray these doctrines in ways that they fit together, that they, they make sense. And of course, he's responding to some, some, some questions as well. Um, and then the question is, oh no, I've got several questions for you. Here you go. When you recognize a literary pattern based on repetitions, based on symmetry, based on parallelism in structures or, or parallelism in wording, um, it's fair to ask a couple of questions. One question is, is this coincidence or is it intentional? And how would you know the difference? Okay, here's something that is not in the chapter in the book. When I think about this question, I'm reminded of a sacrament meeting talk that I heard about 30 years ago. Um, I have heard thousands of sacrament meeting talks in my life, and I remember very few of them specifically, but this one I remember. So uh, it was a, a young father in the ward who talked about going on a fishing trip with his son, and uh, they went to a favorite uh, trout stream that he knew about, and within five minutes he had caught a fish. And he said, this is going to be a great day. Ten minutes later he caught another fish, another five minutes he caught another fish. And he said, I'm a good fisherman, but this is unusual. <laughs> like something, this, this is probably not coincidence. And asking around some people who knew a couple days later, he discovered, maybe, maybe you can guess what's happened, he discovered that the stream had been restocked the day before he showed up. <laughs> like it was full of fish. Like, okay, coincidence or is there some intention? Is there something else going on behind the scenes? Um, and once again, it's the, you know, Five cities, but only three of them are going to be mentioned. And you've got these, um, uh, 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 the speeches to these sons. And, and it's not just one speech to all three sons, but three separate speeches. Like a, a father doesn't quite have to do that. All right, coincidence or incidental. Next one, is there an explanation? I think the explanation probably has to do with Alma's writing and his editing of his material, or, or maybe Mormon's editing. It's kind of hard to tell how... how how intrusive of an editor Mormon is, or whether he's editing lightly. And once again, um, that seems reasonable to me. When Alma knew that he wanted to say something specific to his sons, something that mattered, something that was worth recording, he took some time to, to put it in a form that, that was worthy of the message. Um, I've done similar sorts of things. When it came time to give a name and a blessing to our son, I was nervous about that. As I said, I don't feel like I'm very good at sort of speaking off the cuff, even you know, with the spirit that's supposed to be there. I tried to pre prepare myself. But the week before, I thought about the kinds of blessings that I, want, that I wanted for this boy, and I wrote them out on a, a, some little notes on a three by five card. So when I got up in front of the congregation and the deacon put the microphone next to me and I started praying, I opened my eyes, I pulled out that card and I started, I started to work off of things. Because why can't the Holy Ghost like inspire you a week before as opposed to like right there, right then? Okay, maybe that's not, maybe this is not correct doctrine, but, 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 but the Holy Ghost works in all kinds of ways. Also, I've had occasion to give uh, talks in church or, or, or professional talks, and I have a file of talks that I have given. And usually when I give talks, I go home afterwards and I fix them up and say, oh, this is the talk that I should have given to my ward on Father's Day, that one day. Or this is the talk that I should have given to my fellow Chinese historians in Chicago. The talks that are in my records are way better than the talks that I actually gave. And I'm not sure that that's dishonest, but it's a, uh, okay, maybe a little bit, but okay. And, 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 but Alma, I think, is speaking, I, I can imagine Alma doing something like that. Next question is, what does it mean? It seems to me that the Book of Mormon, particularly Alma's records, are carefully crafted. I think he took time to think about what he wanted to say and how it would connect to things that had been said by prophets before, what it would mean to his sons and what it would mean to people who were reading later on. I think he had a sense that he was writing something that would last, something that would be, that would be scripture eventually. Um, and that sort of understanding nurtures my faith. It, it helps me connect, I think, and it helps me appreciate some of what's gone on behind the scenes in, in the scriptures. 
Another question is, why does it matter? Oftentimes, in situations, talks like these, we want to go right to, this just shows that Joseph Smith couldn't have done it, um, which is an important concept, and it's appropriate for lots of concepts, but I think there's more than that. I think that there are examples to us in, in these sorts of discourses, this sort of historical, theological writing. I think that it's intended to nurture faith and to teach us how to nurture faith as well as we are, are ministering in either the new meaning of that word or sort of a traditional, more general uh, meaning of that. So I'm going to go back just a little bit to talk a, a little bit more about meaning. Let's see if I can get to the right place. See, I said I wouldn't read it, and now it's just confused. Okay, here it goes. Repetition is one of the primary strategies by which the Book of Mormon communicates its messages. Indeed, Nephite authors regularly teach that there are recurring patterns in history, especially as they interpret events through a spiritual lens. Because of God's justice and mercy remain in effect, along with human weaknesses and the wiles of the devil, basic behaviors and outcomes will happen over and over again. The Book of Mormon is filled with repetitions of divine deliverances and punishments, with the preeminent patterns being the destruction of the Jaredites, followed by the destruction of the Nephites for similar reasons, and then warnings of destructions that will come upon Latter-day Gentiles in the Americas if they don't repent of similar sins. So also, in pairing of Zarahemla and Helaman, Gideon, Gideon and Shivlon, Alma, Ammonihah, and Corianton, it suggests that those aren't just individual cities and individual sons that are unique in their own ways, though there's some of that probably, but they seem to represent three distinct spiritual conditions, which may fit any number of cases. This is a typological kind of reading. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'll go back to, all right, um, it may be useful to help us as we try to respond to people that we encounter who may be in similar categories. And remember, the similar categories are going to be wavering and steadfast and transgressors. Um, it's sort of nice that three is a manageable number, so we'll, we won't do subcategories. We'll just try with this. Think of what happens in Zarahemla and to heal them. When we read those together, I want to know, like, what, are the, what do they have in common? What are we supposed to get from this? It's striking how he appeals to recent examples of spiritual deliverances, particularly in the last generation of, of people that they would have known. Um, and to Helaman, he offers a detailed recounting of his own experience. Um, and then he asks both sets of listeners to think about the judgment day and, and whether they'll have a share in God's redemption. He uh, addresses the, the question of spiritual knowledge, as I said before, and is in, in his sermon to his son Helaman, he expands on this message of, of looking at the power of scriptures um, to, to convey a spiritual meaning to later generations. When we think about our relationships with those who may be wavering, maybe there are lessons there. Maybe it's important to share spiritual deliverances that are, but that are familiar, that are not just long, long ago. And scriptures are important as well. Maybe in some circumstances it's appropriate to share deeply personal spiritual experiences, maybe not in every circumstance, but maybe in a few cases. Um, I'm, I'm very struck by the, the, the question in Alma 5 that he asks, where he says, um, can you feel so now? Do you remember that? And that just seems like sometimes the right thing to say to someone who's wondering, is it worth it? Like, what am I doing here? Is there a place for me? But to remind them that you're here because you felt something at some point. And can that happen again? For the steadfast, and hopefully there are lots of people in your life who are steadfast, for whom faith just doesn't seem to be a problem. I don't know that that's me, actually, but, but I know people who are, who are like that. Um, um, they might need less in the way of, of counsel and encouragement, but they need something, right? Those people need some attention as well. And, and Alma in both cases, offers praise, but not too effulgently. And he also reminds them of humility, which is important. Um, he tries to be precise about what he knows and what he doesn't know. Um, and finally, um, 
as he closes those, he invokes blessings upon them. To the people of Gideon, he says, may the Lord bless you, may the, great, may the peace of God rest upon you. And to his son, he says, may the Lord bless your soul and receive you at the last day to sit down in peace. There are, there are ways to minister to those who are not having problems. I'm afraid sometimes people who aren't having problems sort of fall through the cracks because it's so easy to spend most of your time with people who are struggling. Don't forget those people. Okay, and then to tr transgressors. Um, these are relatively long and complex. As I said, they cover similar sorts of, of, of um, topics from a somewhat similar approach. One thing that's striking to me is how much time Alma spends responding to questions, but thoughtfully, listening to what, what the problems are. Um, you uh, may recall that Zezrem starts out by, by trying to trip up Alma, but then he seems to have a change of heart and he asks some, some questions that are a little more sincere. And Alma spends some time to try to, to, try to do that. Um, uh, Antiona is a leader in, in Ammonihah. It's hard to know whether he's sincere or not, but Alma takes time anyways to explain the particular problems that he has with resurrection, uh, the doctrine of resurrection, and how that connects to the, the, the God saying to Adam and Eve um, in the Garden of Eden, when they don't get the tree of life, that, that, um, that you're not going to have eternal life. And he explains like, how that can work together, things that are seemingly contradictory. Um, it may be an example for us, at least in, in Ammonihah, that Alma brings somebody else. He brings in Amulek, somebody that the people know more who might be a better connection than somebody coming from far above and far away in the, in the, in the hierarchy. And that might be useful as well. Um, um, things turn out uh, fairly well, I guess. There's mostly house happy outcomes. Zarahemla seems to go on the right path. Uh, Helaman certainly becomes a leader of the church. Gideon and Shiblon continue in their steadfast ways. Uh, Corianton repents of his transgressions fixes his life and ends up being a, a church leader as well. Of course, the one that's left out is Ammonihah. Um, it, well, Zeezrom is okay, and maybe there's a lesson there that sometimes even in difficult circumstances, individuals can find a way out. Ammonihah is a city, does not work. They are completely destroyed. If I were writing this, I might have been tempted to leave out my biggest failure. <laughs> in life. When I write my personal history, it's full of stories where I'm the hero, where things like work out great. Um, Ammon keeps this one in, and it's a pretty painful story, and it seems to be one that's painful to him for the rest of his life. It's a significant failure. I mean, not on his part, but, it's, but maybe there's a lesson there that, that even the most capable, inspired preaching cannot overcome agency. I mean, they're, they're, we're not really in control of other people's faithfulness. We just try to do the best we can. We try to follow the examples that we see in the scriptures, or the examples we see of people in life or, or uh, in our, our, that we know personally or, or people perhaps that we admire who, have, who have, are good at this sort of thing. And then, and then we do the best we can and, and, and we pray. Um, this is one of my favorite quotations from Brigham Young. He once asked a congregation in the tabernacle, do you read the scriptures, my brethren and sisters? I actually like the fact that he includes sisters in there. Brigham Young was not the most um, gender cognizant sort of guy, but, but every so often it would get the best of him. My brothers and sisters, as though you were writing them a thousand, two thousand, or five thousand years ago, do you read them as though you stood in the place of the men who wrote them? If you do not feel thus, it's in your privilege to do so. Now notice he's not saying, oh, you should put yourself in the situation of people that you read about in the scriptures. He's saying, put yourself in the position of the people who wrote the scriptures. What does that mean? Um, why are there so many parallels between Alma 5 through 16 and chapters 36 to 42, it doesn't seem to me to be an adequate explanation to assume that Alma was just simply recording history as it happened. True, he addresses his three sons according to their birth order, which apparently their birth order, which is kind of maybe the natural you would, way you would do that back, back in that patriarchal age. But when Jacob, in the Old Testament, and Lehi blessed their sons, they actually don't do it in birth order. <laughs> like, that's not the press, that's not the, the way you have to do it. Um, and as we have seen, there seems to be some matching up in structure and in theme and in, in wording. When I try to read the book of Alma as if I were writing it, I'm impressed by his aesthetic sense. 
Alma knew that his message would be important to future generations, and I imagine that it gave him pleasure to take time to compose it in a way that would be pleasing and that would sort of show some craftsmanship. That's a way of showing that you care about something. Have any of you ever written poetry? Has anybody ever received a love poem? Why do people do this? Um, and, and part of it is sometimes ordinary words don't fit the occasion. Sometimes it means more, not if you just go to Hallmark and buy a card, sometimes it means more if you take some time to try to put things in a sort of unique pattern that expresses exactly what you want to say, and the person who receives that message knows that you spent some time on it. Um, it can also make you rather vulnerable. Um, uh, I don't know that I've written a lot of, oh dear, this is not something I was going to say. I don't know that I've written a lot of, of poetry. I did write, um, I've done, <laughs> and now I'm off. I did write a love song once, <laughs> um, and I don't know that it was effective as I had hoped it would be. <clears throat> so it takes some skill, and Alma does this really well, and I admire that <laughs> tremendously. Um, you might think about the Hebrew prophets as well, who, whose inspired admonitions are so much more memorable and striking when they're expressed in beautiful, evocative language. Furthermore, in contemplating what I might have left out or included if I were writing about Alma's life, it's obvious that the Book of Mormon uh, is more concerned with theology than with details of history. Um, as a historian myself, I find the Book of Mormon very frustrating because I would like, to, I would like more details about economic and sociological environmental factors, like this is the way I'm used to thinking about history, and the Book of Mormon sort of slides over a lot of that. It's much more interested in theology. Um, um, though it's a sort of unusual type of theology. Most works of theology have, are propositional, right? So it will, it will give you some systematic historical reasoning, it will give you some basic principles and acts, and it's sort of like lectures on faith, or we have some of this in our, in our own tradition. Or a lot of theology gets written through scripture commentary. There's a little of that in the Book of Mormon, but for the most part, the Book of Mormon offers stories. They are words and actions of historical individuals but those stories are selected, and they're organized, and they're shaped by prophetic author editors, sometimes with some guidance from, a, from a, a, the supervising editor, the editor-in-chief, who's Jesus Christ himself, who comes and tells them what to put in and what not to put in. The narrators have several literary tools at their disposal, including repetition and practical application. Some ideas, some phrases, doctrines are repeated over and over to make sure that you know what's going on. Uh, narratives are repeated in ways that make them seem like variants of the same story. That's this typological approach because uh, God's covenants are sort of the same through history. Abstract principles such as repentance and conversion and compassion are made concrete when they're applied in the lives of specific individuals whose stories are recounted in the text. And quite often, the form of the Book of Mormon follows or reflects or supports its main ideas. So if we turn to this um, that slide, this is going to be sort of a chiastic form here. Um, when, I, when I look at these again, it looks like there's intentional parallelism going on. And, and that invites us to read in a certain sort of way. Once we recognize the literary patterning that makes Alma's preaching journeys parallel to his testimony to his sons, we might ask again, why does that matter? What could these corresponding sermons mean for readers? Perhaps the lesson is that it's not enough to read a single chapter in order to draw out particular doctrines or principles. Book of Mormon narratives were meant to be read in context. As we read and study in depth Alma's three sons, sermons to his sons, it's useful to imagine the personalities, the family dynamics, and the shared experiences that allowed Alma to teach and testify persuasively. But it's also helpful to examine these chapters from an even broader perspective, looking for connections and literary patterns within Alma's writings as a whole. The very structure of the first two-thirds of the Book of Alma, which appears to have been deliberately crafted, invites readers to compare and contrast roughly similar parallel ex exhortations and that leads to questions. What sorts of arguments and appeals does Alma make to people in three types of spiritual conditions? What strategies seem effective? Which fall short and why? Is this a constant, it's this constant back and forth of analyzing and comparing that may be the most beneficial for modern readers since we ourselves are part of the Book of Mormon story. 
Our lives in the 21st century are continuations of the narratives that we encounter in the sacred text with the same God, the same covenants, the same commandments, and the same promises of salvation still in operation. As we attempt to minister to others in various stages of faith, or as we might find ourselves in need of ministering, Alma's multifaceted, rhetorically complex, deeply personal, coordinated sermons are still profoundly relevant. And it has been a pleasure for me to share that with you. I just think this is a most amazing book. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.